Hi everyone and welcome to episode 21 of our Configmas 2022. My name is Johan and in this demo you will learn about improving the config manager boot image. And that means demo time. The first thing with config manager boot images, I recommend that you are on a supported version of the ADK. So if I go over here, here is a link to the currently supported versions and what particular version of config manager they are supported on. But as you can see here, for example, even the good old 2004 is still supported, as well as the newer Windows 11 versions. I don't really care too much about this one, because that one is actually included in the newer Windows 11 versions as well. Now, not being supported doesn't mean it will not work. It typically does work. It simply means that Microsoft no longer tests those versions. But since it's so easy to keep the ADK updated, there is really no excuse for keeping an older version around for too long. Now, if I go back to my search server, or one of my site servers, this one here, I have installed with Windows ADK for Windows 11. This one here, I have installed ADK 2004. And from an operation point of view, there is really no difference. It's more in forms of the drivers that you add that you may have to be a little bit worried about what version you add in to the right boot image. Now, if I go over to my host here and open up a imaging tools command prompt, meaning the one that ADK creates, I can go ahead and create the boot image manually. So I'm going to run a built-in batch file, copy PE, AMD64, and a specifying folder. Configmas episode 21. It creates a boot image. Now, if I want, I can create a boot media out of this one. Make WinP media. ISO. Specify the folder. And specify a name. Perfect. I have a bootable ISO. Now, if I go to virtual machine, like this one here, go to clean snapshot, and boot it on that ISO that I just created. Config mass 21. you will see that pretty much nothing happens. And the way Config Manager and MDT behaves differently is they obviously add their own components to the media. But in this case, when I boot this one up, there's actually a script called or batch file called startnetcmd that is run. And the reason this one is run is because this WinPE, the default one, does not have a winp shell.ini file that tells it to do something else. Also, this one does not have an under 10 file in the root that tell it to do something else. But if I open up a MDT boot image or boot on an MDT boot image, just to show you the difference here. This one, if I press F8, I'm going to adjust the font just a little bit. If I type start nut here, it still exists, but I also have a WMP shell.ini file, and this one tells it to launch an MDT specific binary. Also, in the root of this one, I have an unattended XML file that tells it to try to set the screen resolution and to launch a script. And this is what initiates the MDT deployment. Now, I often use unattended XML files with config manager boot image as well. So let me go over to one of those. Here I have a config manager boot image.
This one launches a PowerShell script when it starts. That's something that I have added. It's not by default. Press F8 to get a command prompt. Once again, adjust the font just a little bit. If I go to the Windows folder on this one, or System32, like the others, this one have a startnet CMD, but since this system also have a VMP shell.ini, it's not going to start it. Instead, Config Manager has its own boot shell that they are launching in the boot image. So this one here is something the Config Manager team created. Now, if I go to that folder, and do a TS boot shell listing, you will see there is also a TS boot shell INI file. This file, good lord, type, is launching the bootstrap, and it also has some variables. And these are settings that you configure in Config Manager that gets added to the boot image. Now, in the root of this boot image, I do have an under 10 file. This one is launching a PowerShell script called start dart. It actually does more than just starting dart. So let me go over to one of my blog posts. I got a question a while back last year from the community. Someone wanted to retrieve the computer name using the admin service way before the sequence was even going or before the environment was initialized. And you can do that through PowerShell in WinP. So that start script that I showed you there is basically this script here, where I'm contacting the admin service, gets the computer name if it exists, and then after that, I kick off the Dart process so it can actually show me the computer name before the client even knows what computer name is supposed to have. Other um, scenarios for using the unattend XML file is to have something happen really early, like showing a front end, like showing a disk clean tool or something, because it's quite common that if you're switching between, say, Windows and Linux on machines, that Config Manager get confused about the disk layout, and you may have to clean it, and it's often very nice to just provide it with utility so the technician can just wipe the disk if needed. Now, another option in Config Manager is to have a TS config file. That's the pre-start option. That happens a little bit later in the boot process. So basically, when someone clicks next here, that's when that file is launched. And in my environment, I do have a TS config file on this one as well. And this one, as you can see here, is launching a script. If I open that script, and I have a copy of it here, it simply tells Config Manager, if it cannot find the policies, please try again. Because these are all default variables. They cannot be set in the unattend file because that's too early, but they can be set via the TS config file via the pre-start option. So if I go over to the variable listing, this is the official documentation. You can see that both of these values, this one and this one, they are zero by default. But by allowing it to retry, if you have a network with high latency, you can actually prevent the config manager boot image from failing by simply asking it to retry a few times more. Other fun things about the config manager boot image is that the default logging level is actually quite low. It only allows for two megabyte log files, and this was an increase from the one megabyte it had earlier. The challenge is a complex sequence can easily generate five, six, seven megs of content, and you don't need to go to any higher math education to realize it's, it's like tricky to take seven megs of content and try to squeeze it into a two meg container. So what happens when that limit is reached, it will spin an archive and another archive, etc. But you can control that behavior by simply placing a well-crafted ini file, smsts.ini, in the Windows folder of the boot image. And by configuring that one, 
In this case, I bumped it up to 60 megs. I have not yet seen a sequence generate more than that, so I figured it would be safe. That way it's easy to find a log file, work with the log file uh, in Config Manager. If you think that by default there is too much verbosity in the log files, it is because by default the logging is enabled. You can disable that and you get a little bit less logging. But I typically keep it enabled and simply bump up the size instead. The trick question is, okay, cool, how do I get that into the Windows folder the boot image? There are a few options here. One, you can go a little bit of an unsupported path. Because in Config Manager, there is, in the installation directory, there is a file called OSD Injection XML. This one contains a listing of all files that are always being added to the boot image, always. And you can add your own components to this list if you want. Now, again, it's not supported. And I can think of two scenarios that may, may be challenging with this. First, it could be that a future update of Config Manager overwrites this file. So you'll have to put back your changes again when that happens. Or it could be that Config Manager doesn't override it because it thinks it's newer. And a needed change that was in the, in, in the new version doesn't get added to the file. But still is, I, I know organizations using this and they're happy with it, but it's so simple to add it into the boot image. So either you use something like this, or you simply go ahead and mount the boot image, copy the files over, and then save the file. That can either be done manually, or it can be done through a PowerShell script like this one here, where I have a path to the inner file I want to add, telling it what boot image I want to work with. I get that boot image from Config Manager, mount the boot image, copy the file, and dismount the changes. The trick when working with boot images is that if you go to the data source of a boot image, there will always be at least two files in that folder. So if I go to this one here, there are two files. If you are doing it manually, make sure to update the little guy. Little by name, little by size. Because that's the template, that's the original. This one here gets created every time you do an update DP. So if you do changes to that one, you update, well, those changes are gone. But shortened version, by making a few minor adjustments to a boot image, you can make the logging behave better and you can improve the resiliency of the boot image. That's all for today. I hope to see you again tomorrow. Have a great rest of your day. Bye for now.